So, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first of this year's uh, Sci Talks. And we have a really interesting uh, talk this afternoon, and the title says it all. It's why we ignore climate change and what we can do about it. Um, we've known about climate change, to my certain knowledge, for about 40, 50 years now, um, but we're still uh, rushing towards it and talking about what we should do about it. Uh, have the next slide, please. So my name is David Bott. Uh, this is what I look like before lockdown. And the other person who you will be interacting with this afternoon is Paul. Uh, Paul is the Q&A moderator. When we get to the Q&A session, he will look after the, the, uh, the questions and such. Uh, one of the things we've learned from these, these systems is that uh, some of you leave it till the last moment to ask the questions, which makes it a bit difficult and there's an embarrassing silence. So if you have a question at any point during the talk, can you put it into the, the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your screen? Uh, Paul will sort them and ask... Uh, the speaker, Toby, uh, them at the end of the meeting. Um, you are in listen only mode. Uh, so, you know, you won't be able to do anything, but, but please put the questions in and we'll, we'll have a debate at the end. Um, this of course is a very, very important subject. So if those of you who are uh, uh, Twitterers uh, can please use the hashtag nudging climate action uh, and you'll understand why as you go through the talk, uh, that would, help to spread the word and uh, you know as with all of the side talks this will be available at some point uh, as a YouTube video. So we are really lucky today to have uh, Toby Park talking to us. Uh, the Behavioural Insights team which I think he's going to explain a little bit about is a really interesting idea. I first ran into it about 12-13 uh, years ago when it was actually uh, located at number 10. It was a government driven institution which was using behavioral science to try and address policy problems. Um, a few years ago, it was sort of spun out of government, uh, first uh, through, through part share with Nesta and now, as I understand it, fully with Nesta. Uh, and it's a really interesting organization to talk to about this sort of thing. Um, and we're lucky that Toby uh, has said, uh, it, it's really interesting that as a person has both psychology and engineering in their background because they're very dis disciplines and he's been working in this field for a number of years and has an interest in all these aspects of climate change so he's going to talk to us this afternoon on the, the, the sort of the question of why people have ignored climate change for so long and what we can do about making sure they face up to it and address it. Toby over to you. Um, wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, so yes, exactly right. I'm going to talk to you for the next 45 minutes or so about why we ignore climate change um, and hopefully uh, not uh, make it an entirely depressing presentation and focus somewhat on what we can do about it as well. I'll give you a bit of an introduction to the Behavioural Insights team in a moment, um, but, but just before we do get into that, um, if you could humour me and maybe start with a game. So feel free to grab a pen and paper or indeed just grab your phone and open up a note application or something. Uh, this is a memory test, so don't write anything down just yet. I'm gonna read out a series of words uh, and your task is to remember as many of them as you can. And then when I move on from this slide, I'll ask you to write down as many as you can remember. So the words are bed, rest, awake, tired, dream, wake, snooze, blanket, doze, slumber, snore, nap, peace, yawn, and drowsy. Okay, I'll give you a couple of minutes. Uh, write down as many of those words as you can recall. I'm sure you haven't got all of them, but hopefully you've got a few down there. I will come back to that uh, a little bit later in the presentation. We'll see how you did. But for now, let me backtrack and just give you a brief introduction to the Behavioural Insights team. So as you heard, we started life in 2010 in 10 Downing Street. At the time, we were the world's first uh, government institution dedicated to the application of behavioural science to policy problems. Uh, we've since spun out, so we partially spun out in 2014. Uh, and actually just last year, the innovation charity Nesta uh, bought the entire company. So we're now fully independent from government, but we still work very closely with governments around the world. Um, we're sometimes known as the nudge unit. Um, I have no issue with that moniker, but it's not a moniker we've given ourselves, um, really because nudging, and I'll explain what nudging is momentarily, is just a small part of what we do. It's actually much broader than that. We're really all about 
um, I suppose, uh, just simply understanding people, so their needs, their quirks, their wants, their habits, their decision-making processes, and so on, um, and trying to build a better, i.e. more effective um, uh, government, both in terms of processes and policy, um, and of course, a better society by applying uh, behavioral science expertise to uh, social problems. Um, so, you know, as we put it there, our purpose is to have a positive impact for people, planet and society by designing more human-centered policy and services. Um, a nudge, on the other hand, is quite a specific term. A nudge is a specific type of behavioral intervention designed to softly encourage or support or enable a certain behavior, uh, usually by making sort of subtle changes to what we call the choice environment um, and without restricting uh, that freedom of choice. So that's a sort of specific element of what we do, but very far from all of what we do. So just to give you a couple of examples of a nudge, just so we can start with a sort of common understanding. This is one many of you will be familiar with, um, either directly or indirectly. But uh, back before 2012, um, we in the UK had to uh, proactively opt in to have a private workplace pension. Uh, policy was introduced at that time point uh, so that the default was flipped. So you would automatically get a private workplace pension unless you chose to opt out. That had a significant and fairly dramatic impact on the number of people saving for retirement uh, in the subsequent years. So this, in a way, is a classic example of a nudge because it really sort of ticks all the boxes that define a nudge. So for one thing, it is liberty preserving. In fact, the degree of liberty here over your choice is exactly equal to that prior to the policy, albeit it's obviously been flipped. So you are just as free to either choose a pension or not choose a pension as you wish. But now if you just do nothing, and of course the reality is a lot of people do just do nothing and go with the flow, you will end up with a pension, whereas previously uh, you wouldn't. It's also classically nudge-like in the sense that it's drawing on behavioral science um, uh, in its design inherently. Uh, in this case, the simple insight that we tend to often stick with defaults. That's partly because we're all a little bit lazy and we just sort of go with the flow and what happens happens. Uh, but it's also partly because we see defaults as a sort of implicit recommendation or some kind of safe uh, sort of middling choice. Um, and so that, that obviously has a, a, a degree to bear on this, on this decision as well. It also, I would say, perhaps succumbs to some of the criticisms of nudging. So for example, it's clearly a sort of one size fits all intervention. There in the population, there will presumably be a cohort of people for whom having a private workplace pension is in their best, best interests and aligned with their um, underlying preferences, uh, and a cohort in the population for whom not having a private pension would be in their interests. And whilst uh, people are free to opt in or out uh, as they wish, uh, obviously the fact that this intervention has an impact on the average means that it is in, to some extent influencing behaviour, um, and it is doing so in a sort of one-size-fits-all uh, approach. Another example of a nudge, more in the sustainability space, we've done some work with, in this case, the city of Portland in the US. They were trying to encourage people to uh, take up and trial their new cycle share scheme. We were working with them on some simple promotional materials, and we wanted to test the insight of uh, uh, giving people those promotional materials at a particular point in their lives. And in this case, it was when they just moved home. So we targeted new home movers. Uh, we ran a randomized control trial where we tested the impact of the promotional materials amongst new home movers versus uh, a control group who already lived in the area. Uh, and we found that new home movers were four times as likely to trial the new cycle scheme as people who already lived there. The insight there simply being that when you've just moved home, of course, your habits and in particular your transport and mobility habits are momentarily disrupted. So we want to want to kind of get in there quick before new habits are formed. And those people were much more amenable to trying the public cycling scheme. So again, classic example of a nudge. It's not restricting liberty, it's simply using uh, a bit of insight into human behavior to encourage, gently encourage and support, uh, in this case, a sustainable behavior. So let's um, sort of deviate a little bit into some of the theory and, and sort of unpack this a bit. So if you're like most people, you've probably got a sort of intuitive understanding of cognition, of decision-making, of behavior, um, and it will probably look something like this. So, you know, we all have certain values, certain attitudes, certain beliefs and preferences and wants. Uh, if we're faced with a set of choices, we might um, weigh up those choices in a sort of quasi-rational way. We might think, well, what option is going to give me most of what I want or is most likely to give me most of what I want? Uh, in classical economic terms, that is uh, the sort of formal model of rational choice based on maximizing our utility. 
From that, we might form intentions to act. And then from those intentions, we might simply act on them. And of course, that sort of implies we have unlimited willpower. Uh, of course, if we think about this a bit more deeply, we might recognize that it's not all like this. So, you know, we might perhaps recognize that our preferences are quite complex. We often have competing preferences. Maybe we want to eat that cake right now, but simultaneously we want to be healthier and, you know, have a healthier diet. We, of course, similarly do not have unlimited willpower to act on all of our intentions. Uh, you're probably aware that we we'll certainly feel that some of our decisions are made more with our heads, some of them perhaps more with our guts or our hearts. And perhaps you're also aware that, you know, much of your behavior, or at least some of it, is perhaps a little bit on autopilot. Maybe, you know, you're driving to work on a route that you've taken hundreds of times before. Are you thinking deeply about that complicated process of driving the car every time you do it? Obviously not. A lot of it's been sort of pushed into the background and, and automated. Uh, so, uh, you know, we need to account for these um, sort of more realistic uh, insights into human behavior when we're uh, designing, you know, policies, processes, public services, uh, and so on. So in a better starting point, this is also a very simple model of human behavior, but it's a better starting point. Um, Danny Kahneman, a Nobel laureate uh, in economics, although a, a psychologist by training, uh, many of you may have seen or read his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, which essentially expounds on this particular model. But his idea is that we essentially have these sort of two models of thinking, what he calls system one uh, and system two, or thinking fast and slow. So on the one hand, we have this very sort of fast, automatic, intuitive, effortless sort of mode of thinking. So if I asked you, well, what's two times two? The answer would probably pop into your head without you even thinking about it. In fact, it's probably difficult to not think of the answer. As I say, if you're taking your daily commute, you've done hundreds of times before, it's a very automatic process. On the other hand, we are, of course, perfectly capable of more deliberative, reflective, analytical thinking. If you're planning a trip you've never taken before, for example, you'd have to think more carefully about that. Well, the key insight is simply that much more of our thought processes and decision-making is embedded in system one than we tend to realize. Uh, and there are a number of consequences um, of that. For one, uh, it's that we tend to be quite susceptible to a range of quite predictable biases in our decision-making because we adopt all these kind of mental shortcuts that have evolved for perfectly good reason because they're highly efficient and they're right a lot of the time, but they are nonetheless predictably biased in a certain direction and are not right all of the time. Uh, but also we are, as a consequence, very, very susceptible to uh, environmental effects on behavior. And what I mean by that is the way that choices are presented to us, uh, the context in which they're presented, both the social context, but also the physical context, uh, features uh, in the economic environment, such as pricing, costing, and so on. All of these external attributes have a huge influence on our behavior often as much or more than internal attributes like attitudes, values, wants, and so on. But of course, we tend to be a little bit less aware of that when we're going about our daily lives making decisions. So one sort of useful way of thinking about this is this behavioral model called ISM, which stands for Individual, Social, and Material. And you don't need to look at this slide in too much detail, but really just take away that, uh, you know, we are of course individual decision makers. Uh, we have both more conscious, uh, aspects to our cognition, so our knowledge, our attitudes, our intentions, and so on, as well as perhaps less conscious, less deliberative aspects to our decision making, like habit, like emotion, like what we call heuristics, which are these kind of cognitive shortcuts, things like, well, all else being, being equal, I just choose the middle option, or I just do what other people seem to be doing, those kind of shortcuts. Um, but we are, of course, situated within a context, within both the social context, where there are certain norms, there are certain shared understandings and meanings associated with activities and items around us. We might have a particular identity that has certain social implications and so on. And of course, we're within a material context as well, characterized by different rules and regulations, different pricing, different technology and infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. And the point I suppose can be distilled into this analogy that we are in a sense like swimmers in a stream. Uh, and so, yes, we have the opportunity to swim in one direction or another under our own power, uh, but we are, of course, also in a stream that has a current. And so when I say a current, I mean the, the norms, what's easy, what's available, what's cheap and affordable, what's socially valued, etc., will all massively influence our behaviour in one way or another. And those are things we don't have individual direct control over so easily. So just to give you a sort of trivial, but I think actually quite revealing example of this, if you ask people what coffee they would like when presenting them small, medium and large in this manner, obviously there's a certain distribution of choices, but the majority of people tend to go for the medium. 
Uh, and if you ask them why, they tend to say, well, the small is a bit too small for me, the large is a bit too large for me, the medium is the right size. Uh, but if you do this and take away the old small and introduce a bigger option and present the new choice set, people tend to go for the new medium. And you ask them why, and they say, well, the small is a bit too small, the large is a bit too large, the medium is the right size. But of course, the medium is the old big, so is it really the right size? Uh, so in other words, we're quite profoundly influenced by these relatively small, seemingly trivial changes to our environment, what we call the choice environment, the way that choices are presented, framed, designed, and so on. Uh, and they have a big impact on our behavior, but we tend to perhaps slightly retrospectively overlay a more rational explanation of our own behavior. In this case, claiming it was the sort of absolute size of the coffee that, um, that oriented our decision, when actually it was more, more about the presentation of the relative sizes within the choice set. So you can already see here how organizations can perhaps influence the decisions of their customers. You might, if you've been to the cinema recently, uh, wonder why there is such a range of excessively sized portions of popcorn, for example. It's not just a sort of small, medium and large, it's more likely to be a sort of regular, large, extra large, gargantuan, etc. Um, and they're doing that not necessarily because they expect to sell that many of the biggest portion, but by adding in that enormous portion, they're going to sell more of what would have been the biggest portion, i.e. one portion down from the biggest. Uh, because, of course, the choice set implies that, you know, what would have been a pretty big portion is now more kind of middle of the road and more normal. So, you know, we're being influenced in this way all the time. Obviously, in some cases, for profit of the entity that's doing the influence, and hopefully, in some cases, for good of society and for good of ourselves. All right, let's go back to the memory task. Now, um, normally when I'm doing this in person, I like to see people put up their hands and so on. I, at the moment, can't see the comments or the feedback, so I'm gonna have to trust that uh, you are in some way engaging with this and responding, but uh, uh, maybe just to yourselves or in your head, or, or by all means use the chat if you can see each other on the chat. Let's see how many people remembered the following. How many people remembered bed? Well, this one is normally quite common and people do tend to remember it. Uh, and you might guess why, and that's because it was first in the list. So we tend to remember things that are first and last in lists much more than things that are sort of buried in the middle. It's called the primacy and recency effect. But what about wake? Blanket? Nap? Sleep? Now I'm going to hope a bunch of you put your hands up on sleep. I've done this dozens of times and normally it works. In fact, it's worked every time. Uh, but particularly well done for those of you who did remember sleep, because sleep wasn't actually on the list. Uh, obviously, every word on the list relates to sleep. Um, so it's a bit of a cheap trick, uh, but it does have an important point behind it, which is to say that you know our brains are clearly not sort of perfect databases, repositories of information that go into our eyeballs. What actually tends to happen with this kind of activity is that we remember the gist, we remember the narrative, we remember the theme, and of course we retroactively build up the details afterwards when we are required to call upon them. Um, this of course has huge implications in things like uh, witness statements and so on, where perhaps the witness of a crime might sort of interpret events, put some kind of meaning on them, perhaps create a bit of a narrative in their mind, and then they were all quite you know, legitimately in their minds uh, uh, confabulate details after the fact that may not actually have occurred. But the broader point here is really to highlight that, you know, our brains are complicated machines and we can't always rely on introspection alone to understand exactly how they operate. And there's quite a lot going on sort of beneath the surface uh, of awareness. Um, but don't worry, um, around about half of people tend to falsely remember sleep in this test, so you're in good company. Okay, so why is any of this important for climate change? Well, I'll firstly just start by saying that we absolutely know that behavior change, whether we want to call it behavior change, lifestyle change, different green choices, whatever, it is necessary um, to achieve net zero. And unfortunately, quite a bit of it, it would be much easier if that wasn't the case. Uh, but unfortunately it is. This particular graph here is from the International Energy Agency, uh, although the Climate Change Committee in the UK have done similar analysis and it's almost identical actually for the UK context. Uh, this is essentially a sort of simplistic pathway to net zero between now and 2050. And what it shows is that close to 60% of emissions reductions required between now and 2050 depend on some degree of behavior change. Uh, now, a relatively small portion of that is 
what we might consider sort of absolute curtailment behaviors. So that's things like flying less, eating less red meat and so on. Um, whereas the larger portion is actually more about technology adoption behavior. So that's, you know, buy an electric vehicle instead of a petrol diesel one, buy a heat pump instead of a fossil fuel boiler, that sort of thing. But nonetheless, those are still absolutely behavioral challenges that need to be addressed at the policy level, as well as, of course, uh, through industry. We also know that, you know, thankfully people do care. We've sort of won this argument in the UK over the last 10 years or so, thankfully. Um, and people are also fairly willing, at least in principle, to change some of their behaviours. So the figures on the left there, some data from some studies we did uh, mid last year, actually sort of in the run up to COP26. Um, sample of a couple of thousand uh, representative UK uh, individuals, uh, actually almost all of them said when presented with a, with a fairly long list of about a dozen um, pro environmental behaviours they might consider adopting, almost all of them said they would be happy to take up at least one of them. Uh, about 67% said they'd be happy to take up around five of them. Um, about half of people have taken any of the actions on the list in the last six months. So you can immediately see there, there's a bit of a, what we call an intention action gap. In other words, our intentions uh, are often greater than our actual actions, but nonetheless, there is willing there, which is obviously a great start. Uh, the figure on the right is from the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategies latest uh, instance of their attitude tracker. Um, and again, just showing that actually the, the great majority, 85% of people, uh, are, uh, are concerned about climate change. So I don't think we're in a situation that's sometimes sort of slightly comically painted of a significant cohort of um, deniers of man-made climate change or people that just don't care. It's a bit more nuanced than that and it's more about how, well we, how can we turn that concern into, uh, into actual action. Uh, despite this concern and this willingness, we also know that effort uh, and by extension cost is, uh, is greatly off-putting. So, you know, this result here is very obvious, but it's nonetheless, I think, useful to see it. Um, this is just a plot showing uh, the percentage of people willing to take up an action and their, their perception that an action is easy. And of course, it's a very strong positive correlation, meaning basically that people are much more willing to do things that are very easy and much less willing to do things that are perceived to be hard. So buying an electric vehicle, changing one's diet, not so popular because they're deemed to be difficult, uh, whereas things like um, you know, putting your appliances on eco settings and so on, people are willing to do that. But we're also a bit confused about which actions have the most impact. So this is a plot of perceived impact in terms of uh, carbon emission reductions versus actual impact, uh, just in a simple sort of rank format. Um, and what we see, unfortunately, is not only is a you know, no correlation, it's actually a slightly negative correlation. So we're sort of systematically getting this wrong uh, as a population in terms of where we, where we perceive the worthwhile actions to be. We tend to, for example, massively overestimate in our minds the impact and the value of recycling uh, or turning our lights off. Uh, or perhaps things like um, you know, not leaving our phone charging uh, beyond its, you know, once it's fully charged. Those things generally have a pretty pretty small impact on, on climate change, whereas things like changing the vehicle you're driving, flying less, changing your diets and so on, or just driving less, these have, have a bigger impact. Okay, let's move on to the sort of nub of the question of this presentation. Why are we not well built for thinking about climate change? I wanna highlight three um, uh, sort of factors in particular. I could have chosen others, but I feel like these three are fairly dominant and they are that it's too psychologically distant in our minds, we're too good at fooling ourselves uh, and action too rarely benefits us personally and I'll obviously expand on those uh, each in turn. So what do I mean by it's too psychologically distant? So let's imagine a situation where I have some cash in my hand, I'm there with you right now and I'm offering you that cash for real. Uh, would you rather have £100 in cash right now this instance or would you rather delay that gratification and have 110 pounds in a week's time? Well, you can answer that question yourselves in your heads. This study and variations of it have been done many, many thousands of times, but I can tell you that the majority of people would go for the 100 pounds right now. Um, but interestingly, if we sort of flip that a bit and say, well, what about 100 pounds in a year's time or 110 pounds in a year and one week's time? And there, the vast majority of people would go for 110 pounds in a year and one week's time, which is interesting because the difference is the same. It's an extra 10 pounds to wait an extra week. But of course, what we're dealing here with here is a sort of proportional 
uh, evaluation of time rather than an absolute evaluation of time. So waiting an extra week now feels very different to adding an extra week onto a wait of a year. Um, and so in other words, what this shows is, is, is that we discount the future. We value the present much more than we value the future. Uh, that is, of course, relatively logical. Uh, like most sort of cognitive biases, quote unquote, there is a rational reason beneath this, of course, we value the present more than we value the future. The present is here, it's definitely happening. Getting through the present the best way we can is an absolute necessity, while the future is, to varying degrees, hugely uncertain. Um, but rightly or wrongly, you know, our psychology seems to take this to the extreme. Um, and this, of course, does not lend itself to motivating us to give up short term gratification in order to benefit society in the long term, which is, of course, an absolute necessity when it comes to addressing climate change. The figure on the right there just shows how steep that discount factor is. So it's called hyperbolic discounting because experimentally, when you run this test thousands of times of different valuations and so on, different timescales, the curve that you plot ends up being very much hyperbolic. So in other words, it's even steeper than a sort of exponential curve. Um, and just in case you're sort of thinking, well, you know, this doesn't apply to me. I, I genuinely do think that long-term well-being of society is really, really important. I'm not saying that we don't think that sort of in principle, but our behavior does reveal that we unambiguously tend to prioritize the present over the future. So just to give you a few examples, you know, this is partly why many people uh, uh, participate in uh, uh, risky behaviors um, like smoking, like unsafe sex and so on, which of course deliver gratification in the moment and the risks associated with them tend to be very much in the future. Likewise, things like heavy drinking, you know, you get a hangover the morning after uh, and nonetheless, that doesn't stop you doing it in the moment. Um, or think about perhaps procrastinating. We procrastinate because the thing we want to do right now that's more fun uh, looms large uh, in our minds, whereas the consequence of procrastinating, failing our exams next week or whatever it might be, uh, is unfortunately very steeply discounted in that moment of decision. It's also why, of course, as we saw earlier, not enough people tend to save enough for retirement. And for our context, it matters because often making pro-environmental choices requires us to maybe incur a bit more cost in the, in the present for our future benefit both for us and for society. So even just for an individual decision, things like, you know, what washing machine do you buy? Uh, how willing are we to spend a bit more upfront to get a more efficient one that saves us money in the long term? Well, that upfront cost will loom larger in our minds than that long-term running cost saving, for example. Um, I sometimes think that budget airlines entire business model is kind of predicated on future discounting, because of course, when you're booking that flight, perhaps a month or two before you fly, saving 12 quid seems like a great idea and then you get on the flight and it's an absolutely insufferable experience and never am I going to do that again but of course you're never booking it um you know after you've taken the flight you're always booking it before you've taken the flight and so that cost saving seems worth it at the time uh, if that doesn't sell it to you think about the uh, the hangover example imagine if you had to have a hangover before you enjoyed the drink how many people would ever drink that heavily if they had to um have a, an intolerable hangover the, the entire morning before they go out. I would suspect not many people would drink as much. So clearly, you know, this is a real issue when we're dealing with um, climate change, where the impacts are, of course, in the future, but the costs uh, and the effort we must incur to avert them are in the present. Uh, and this is really just sort of one dimension of psychological distance. I'm talking about uh, temporal distance here, psychologically. Um, but we can also think about a variety of other things, so geographic distance, in other words, the consequences of climate change, we perhaps have them in our minds as happening primarily in other places. And, you know, in the UK, notwithstanding the, the devastation of, of floods that we've, we've all seen on the news, we maybe we're right in that. Maybe actually, we, you know, we're, we're going to get off lightly compared to many nations, particularly small island nations. Um, but there's also, I think, a degree of perhaps cultural distance as well, the extent to which we can really feel like uh, climate change is going to happen to people like us. Um, uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, we've seen that certainly in, um, uh, in other issues, be that things like um, uh, refugees crossing into Europe and so on, where actually if you can really make the issue salient to someone and sort of bring it home, perhaps by uh, highlighting more sort of identifiable victims, individuals and so on, that can often uh, resonate with people more strongly than sort of abstract, more distant uh, discussion on, on the issue.
So that is one of our three issues. Let's move on to the second one, which is that we are too good at fooling ourselves. So I'll explain this point maybe first by just highlighting this tension that I think we all have within us. So this is a tension between, between doing what is in our own self-interest, in other words, what's fun, what's cheap or profitable, what's easy and so on, uh, and doing what we believe is right or altruistic or in the best interest of others. Uh, and that tension exists in all of us. It's nothing necessary to be ashamed of. We can't expect everybody to live utterly saintly, selfless, abstemious existences, of course, but nonetheless, we would also hope that most people live their lives in a way that gives some consideration to other people and the benefit of society. So the basic instinct, sorry, the basic insight is that we tend to have this instinct where we, we like to think of ourselves uh, as decent people. Um, and yet we all act at least to some degree in our own self-interest, of course. So this can create this sort of feeling of dissonance uh, because, you know, let's maybe give an example, um, taking a flight uh, to an exotic location or sitting in an air-conditioned apartment and eating a steak on the beach served by locals whose beach community might not even exist in 50 years' time. Uh, we do that whilst also simultaneously maintaining a belief that we care about the environment and reducing decent people and so on. And we're all a little bit guilty of this to some extent. Um, so it's a balancing act. So, you know, how do we resolve that dissonance? That's the question. Um, and logically, you might say, well, there are two ways you can resolve that dissonance. Firstly, you can just plow on willfully with the self-interested behaviours and just give up our values. But of course, that is too awkward. We feel guilty. We perhaps pay a social cost for that. Um, or we can live more truly to our values. We can live a more abstemious or more saintly existence. But of course, that's generally too hard or perhaps too expensive or too boring. Uh, so what we tend to do is have our cake and eat it too. And that is where rationalization comes in. So I particularly like this quote by the science fiction writer Robert A. Heinlein. Uh, Man is not a rational animal. He is a rationalizing animal. And I think there is some absolute truth to that. Or well, this quote from some academics that have focused on dishonesty uh, and sort of self-deception for, for, for many years now. Um, people like to think of themselves as good. However, selfishness pays and it often pays well. How do people resolve this tension? Uh, this research shows that people behave selfish, selfishly enough to benefit, but do enough good to delude themselves of their own integrity. So in other words, we're just, we're natural storytellers and there's many ways that we can paint a, a sort of positive image of ourselves while nonetheless continuing to pollute, et cetera, et cetera. So it, here's just a few sort of psychological terms that, 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 we, that we sort of refer to in this context So normalization. In other words, we tell ourselves that oh, well, everyone's doing it. That's minimization. Well, I only do it once in a while. It's not that bad. Moral licensing is very common. So you look to something good that you've done and sort of use that as a bit of an excuse to get out of doing something else. So, you know, I do my bit by recycling, perhaps, so I don't feel that guilty about occasionally flying for business. Um, perhaps just an evasion of responsibility. It's not my fault. Government needs to change, et cetera, et cetera. Perhaps even just a bit of willful ignorance or just avoidance of the issue, not really thinking about it. And of course, most of these will have a degree of truth, perhaps a lot of truth in them. That's how we sort of persuade ourselves of their validity. It's not to say that we're absolutely deluding ourselves. It's just that our ability to draw on this process of rationalization, of course, massively dampens uh, the sting of conscience, conscience and, uh, and the values through which we would otherwise perhaps be more keen to act in the betterment of society. Um, underlying a lot of this is this bias we call confirmation bias, which is our tendency to sort of seek out, uh, listen to, heed, and remember information and evidence that supports either our prior beliefs or indeed beliefs that we want to be true rather than taking a sort of ruthlessly scientific approach in our minds. Um, so, you know, an example of this a little game that, again, you can play in your minds. Let's say there's a rule here that if a card has a vowel on one side, then it must have an even number on the other side. Which two cards would you turn over to test the rule? Well, most people tend to get A, and that is, of course, a correct answer. A is a vowel, and so to test the rule, uh, if the rule is correct, it must have an even number on the other side. If it doesn't, then we've disproved the rule. Um, nobody says Q, and that's also correct, but the four and the seven often confuses people. Uh, often, um, uh, people would go for the four, because, of course, it's an even number, and they're sort of trying to confirm an outcome of this rule, but actually the, the correct answer would, uh, would, of course, be the seven, uh, because if the seven has a vowel on the other side, then the rule is broken. Whereas whatever's on the other side of four, it doesn't matter. 
It doesn't say that if there's an even number, it has to have a vowel. It says if there's a vowel, it has to be an even number. So in a sense, this is kind of the black swan problem. And if somebody told you all swans are white and you wanted to prove or disprove that, uh, that theory, just going around looking for white swans and saying, there's another white swan, there's another white swan, there's another white swan, does nothing to prove or disprove that theory. That is why the scientific method is generally geared around disproving or an attempt to disprove a hypothesis. And if you cannot disprove this hypothesis, then perhaps you tentatively cling on to it for a bit longer. Uh, okay, third reason, action too rarely benefits us personally. So what do I mean by that? Well, um, let's consider how the incentives stack up for green behaviours. So let's you know choose any green behavior you like buying electric vehicles stop taking flights restricted diet rinse every yogurt pot you ever use etc etc or indeed maybe at the more national level like implementing an aggressive national carbon tax or a net zero business policy within your business the costs to the individual of doing that are of course relatively high whereas the individual benefit of those actions is frankly near zero that's because of course if i individually buy an electric vehicle the carbon mitigation benefits of that in the grand scheme of things are absolutely trivial and any benefit to me is diffused almost to, to nothing. And yet the cost of doing that is of course quite high. Whereas collectively, the cost of everybody doing that of course is also high, but the collective benefit is very, very high. So what we've got here is this misalignment between individual costs and benefits and societal costs and benefits. And this is the problem because it means there are things that absolutely make sense to do as a society. And yet if we just rely on individual action, it will tend to not happen because it never makes much sense for any given individual to do the thing that makes sense for everybody to do. So there's a bit of a sort of paradox there. We call this a collective action problem. So there's this complete disconnect between what's in all individuals' self-interest in terms of the costs versus benefits of them taking green actions and the groups self-interest in terms of the group's costs versus benefits. So it only makes sense if everybody acts together, but any individual is generally better off in a sort of slightly Machiavellian, uh, you know, rational sense at least, by freeloading off of the group. And so this will have a tendency or a risk of spiraling into a tragedy of the commons where, um, you know, if one individual starts freeloading, others will because it suddenly makes no sense for them to, to co contribute and so on. This can obviously occur between individuals, but it can also occur between businesses, it can occur between countries, which is partly why it's so difficult to get the entire globe to implement a robust carbon uh, price. Because of course, any one country does it, they're probably gonna harm their economy because businesses would move abroad. It only makes sense if everybody does it at the same time. And that is incredibly difficult to achieve when there is always an incentive for, for an individual country to not do it. That is essentially the tragedy of the commons. Um, now, there are, of course, traditional solutions to this. And traditionally, through a sort of classical economic lens, you would try and realign both individual and collective interests or incentives. So you can have bans with sort of strict punishments. You can have quotas, likewise, with strict punishments if you breach them. You can, of course, have taxes on individual behaviour so that the externalised cost of one's polluting behaviour is re-internalised into that decision maker or you can have privatization. So you just privatize the natural resource or the common good uh, so that it is within an individual's, individual company's best interest to look after and sustain that. Um, but of course, they all have problems as well. We don't necessarily want to privatize our atmosphere or our water, et cetera. Um, but thankfully, there are also sort of psychological naturally occurring partial solutions as well. So we have a great tendency to conform to norms, for example. We have a great tendency to reciprocate favours to others. When other people do good things for us, we feel obliged to do them back. We, of course, ostracise freeloaders, and we will be ostracised if we are also freeloading off of society. We have a sense of guilt and obligation to do the right thing. We have a sense of group belonging and so on. So in other words, we have evolved many of these traits as a sort of natural solution to these collective problems. And thank goodness we have. Um, and of course, I would highlight that, you know, this tension wouldn't even exist uh, if we can uh, make the green actions just better for individuals. So think, you know, you don't need to buy a Tesla as some sort of act of virtue or some sort of self-sacrificial donation to the common good. You can just buy one because it's a great car and job done. That is, of course, uh, an easier solution as well. 
So in other words, you know, as this famous psychologist, uh, Jonathan Haidt uh, says, um, we are indeed uh, selfish hypocrites, so skilled at putting on a show of virtue that we fool even ourselves, it speaks to my second point. But thankfully, we also have the ability like bees in a hive to work for the good of the group. Um, so, you know, true altruism outside of our own genetic kin, in other words, truly sort of self-sacrificial for strangers type of behavior is pretty rare, but we certainly have a lot of what we would call conditional altruism based on reciprocity. Um, so I think, you know, you feel obliged to invite your friends for dinner after they've done so for you or to send Christmas cards to those who sent you on last year and so on, because you know that to not reciprocate is a bit of a social taboo. Uh, and in fact, social life is sort of interwoven with, with millions of these sort of small reciprocal acts. And this is very much a norm embedded within human behaviour that helps sort of glue the functioning society together. Um, the problem, of course, is that um, these evolved traits towards cooperation, reciprocation and so on, uh they just don't work that well to run a large complex industrial society of seven billion people uh so some of you may have heard of dunbar's number for instance this is the idea that a functional society can sort of work just on interpersonal relations where everybody knows everybody so there's a social uh sort of cost and benefit associated with with all manner of interactions that kind of works up to maybe around about 150 people um don't take that number with too much precision but the point is essentially true so the tragedy of the commons is a very real thing and is essentially the main reason why we need these sort of big carbon taxes so that big, so that being profitable, being self-interested at least aligns with being green, because we can't be utterly dependent on sort of self-sacrificial altruistic behavior alone. I would also say that when it comes to reciprocity, we don't always think this cynically. We're not sort of going around our lives going, oh, I should probably return that favor because somebody did one for me. It's rather that this tendency towards conditional cooperation, it is an optimal solution to most uh, mutual gain and mutual competition situations. In other words, situations where cooperation leads to mutual gain or situations of competition where there is a scarce resource to compete over. Mu uh, so sort of conditional cooperation is generally the strategy that is most effective. Um, and that is why we've evolved a set of emotional triggers and traits that sort of you know, not just in that direction, things like a sense of gratitude, a sense, a sense of social obligation, a sense of guilt if we don't, a sense of anger at those who do freeload, uh, and so on. So that's the difference between a proximal driver of behaviour, these emotions that we feel and act on, versus the ultimate sort of evolutionary explanation as to why they exist in the first place. Okay, so let me summarise so far, and then I think I'll pick up the pace of it um, for the final section. So, um, Three reasons why it's why we tend to uh, not readily act on climate change. First, it's too psychologically distant. So present bias means we favor the immediate over the future very strongly. Um, and also it's not just about time. Climate change can feel distant in terms of geography, culture, our ability in, to envisage it really happening to us. Um, we're also quite good at fooling ourselves. So many unsustainable behaviors are fun, more affordable, more profitable, easier that's just the norm um, and yet we think of ourselves as good people so we kind of try and have our cake and eat it we do it just enough to buttress that sense of integrity but otherwise we're pretty good at rationalizing our behavior so we can get the best of both worlds psychologically um, and action too really benefits us individually so taking individual action doesn't always make sense because it comes at a high personal cost but low personal benefit so it really only makes sense if we can act collectively and yet there is always going to be a degree of sort of uh, a tendency for individuals to want to freeload um, and so we, you know, we depend on sort of conditional cooperation, but that is very hard to maintain across a big society. Okay, um, I'm going to try and do the remainder of this in no more than 10 minutes. So we might, um, if we want to get 10, 15 minutes of questions in, we might go five, 10 minutes over. I've been told that's okay, so I hope that is. Um, but I'll go as quick as I can. So in terms of what behavioural science can offer in, uh, in terms of solutions, well, one very simple model of behaviour or behaviour change uh, that you can have in your mind is the sort of sum of how easy something is and how motivated you are to do it. Uh, and so we can basically prod on both of those things. We can target individuals' conscious and non-conscious motivations. So, uh, you know, we can think about incentives, of course, education and awareness, how we frame messages to make them more resonant and more compelling, as well as maybe things that we don't always think about so much. So how can we increase the social desirability of green behaviours? How can we harness or address particular cognitive biases like future discounting that we talked about? But we can also make the behavior easier. Uh, and this is really sort of behavioral science 101. If you could do anything 
to encourage sustainable behaviors, make it easier. That is generally the best first port of call. So that might be focusing on individual capabilities like training and know-how or increasing uh, people's opportunity to do something. Um, but also it's about changing the choice environment. So increasing the availability of green options, removing small frictions and points of hassle and inconvenience, using defaults like with the, um, the pension example I gave at the beginning, perhaps using social norms so that we make it easier socially uh, to adopt the green behavior uh, and so on. So I'm gonna just whiz through, skip over that, and whiz through a few concrete examples of how we can put this into practice. So firstly, how can we make green behaviors easy? Well, we've already talked about defaults in the context of pensions. We can very much use smart defaults in the context of green behaviors as well. So for example, there's a couple of studies in Switzerland and Germany that shown that defaulting people into renewable electricity tariffs, again, still with the absolute freedom to opt out and choose whichever tariff you want, but that led to a 10 times increase in the number of customers using those tariffs. Huge impacts from a very simple change. We can also simply increase the availability of options. As I've said a few times, we're very profoundly influenced by our choice environment, how readily available and easily accessible different options are to us. Uh, a lovely study from Cambridge a couple of years ago showed that simply increasing the number of uh, plant-based options in a canteen uh, from one in four to two in four led to a whopping 70% increase in the number of customers choosing those options. These are big impacts, by the way, considering we're dealing with you know, very small sort of soft interventions, not regulation or anything like that. Um, we can also introduce frictions to make unsustainable behaviors a little bit more difficult. So this lovely study showed that we're simply removing the plastic tray from a canteen environment cut food waste significantly because of course now, even though people were free to go up and get seconds and thirds if they wanted to, it was just slightly more difficult to take too much food at the outset that you wouldn't ultimately eat. And I've already talked about this one, this idea of making behavior change easier by harnessing timely moments of change when routines, ingrained habits and so on are already disrupted. And so people are gonna be more amenable to considering new options and, and uh, you know, jumping onto new practices. Uh, we can also motivate new behaviors with different incentives. Uh, the plastic bag levy is an interesting case study. Um, as some of you may well be aware, it's debatable in terms of its impact on plastic use because it's perhaps led to things like an increase in the number of bin bags bought and the bags that we do buy in supermarkets tend to be heavier plastic. But at least at face value, it's sort of primary function to reduce the number of plastic bags being used. It was enormously successful, around about 80% reduction in use. Which is quite interesting because a 10 pence or originally a 5 pence um, fine is quite trivial compared to what 10, 15 pounds worth of groceries you might get um, potentially in a, in a bag. Um, our argument there is it's not really just an, a simple economic incentive, it's more of a nudge because actually that, that small fine is acting more as a prompt, a reminder when you're in the shop that you shouldn't really be using plastic bags. It sets quite a strong social norm in that uh, there is now a much clearer and widespread expectation that you don't use a, a plastic bag. It sets a default because to use one, you now have to ask for one rather than just grab one off the rail. And so all of these things have a, have a combined impact uh, on behavior. We can also think about traditional economic incentives in more innovative ways. So lotteries and prize draws can be quite good. They can give quite good bang for buck um, because uh, we tend to focus more on the size of the prize and we're not particularly good at sort of calculating in our minds the sort of expected value based on low or long probabilities. So let's imagine something like a plastic bottle deposit return scheme where a conventional model would be maybe you pay 10 pence um, when you buy a plastic bottle and you get that 10 pence back when you return it. Imagine instead a situation where yes, you pay 10 pence when you get something in a plastic bottle, but when you return it, you get entered into a lottery with say one in a million chance of a hundred thousand pound ticket. Um, now that plastic bottle is a lottery ticket and our hypothesis would be that that would hold much more value to someone than simply 10 pence and they'd be much more likely therefore to return it. Um, and in the UK, by the way, the number of plastic bottles we use, if that was done, a one in a million chance of £100,000, we would have enough plastic bottles for about 35 winners per day in the UK. So you can imagine again that would perhaps get a lot of attention or attraction with it uh, to really boost engagement. Um, We've also talked a few times about future discounting. And as I said earlier, this matters when it comes to things like, you know, deciding what white goods or indeed what cars you buy, um, electric vehicles, for instance, more expensive up front, as we all know, but drastically cheaper to run. Um, and yet, uh, even if the total lifetime ownership cost uh, 
is preferable for an electric vehicle. Many people may still be put off by the upfront cost because that looms larger in our minds. So simply helping people to be more aware of that long-term cost saving when they're making that purchase decision can be useful. Uh, we ran a study in John Lewis stores where we simply changed the, um, the price label on shelves. Uh, it still showed the upfront cost, of course, but it also showed the, um, the estimated total lifetime cost. Um, and that significantly, um, albeit modestly, um, shifted people towards slightly more expensive upfront, but significantly uh, less energy intensive appliances. Um, and we can also motivate behavior just by talking about things a bit differently, uh, just framing things a bit differently. This is a, an online experiment we ran, uh, although it's since been replicated in Sainsbury's cafes, where we found that simply calling uh, a plant-based breakfast um, field grown instead of meat free, and this was also tried across a number of other dishes, roughly doubled the number of people ordering it. So meat free is quite a miserable description of plant-based food. I think it essentially highlights what's missing. And um, we already know that among um, you know, meat eaters who are perhaps a little bit uh, unenthusiastic about trying vegetarian food, they kind of perceive vegetarian food as lacking something and meat free is you know, merely highlighting what's lacking. So different language absolutely matters. And then finally, we can motivate behavior by making it more social. So one of the most robustly uh, replicated findings in applied behavioral science is the power of social norms and social comparisons. So simply telling people that most other people like them or um, you know their neighbors or some comparison group are already doing X uh, tends to increase the chance that those people will also do X. So this has been uh, tested many times in uh, the energy space for example, so um, giving people social comparisons on their utility bills, showing them that they're using more energy than their neighbors consistently leads to a three to five percent sustained uh, reduction in energy consumption. Uh, you know, this is big. That might not sound like a lot, but um, considering what you would have to do and spend in your home in terms of retrofits and so on to get up to five percent savings uh, when you can do it totally costlessly by simply putting a bit of information on bills, uh, we think that's fairly significant. Uh, but we can also sort of imply norms or try and help uh, new green norms to spread in the real world. So there's some wonderful studies, for example, showing that solar panels are actually socially contagious. Uh, in other words, um, people are more likely to adopt them if homes near them have them, uh, even to the extent where solar panels are on the front of properties, they're more contagious because they're more visible. Um, and that is also, of course, part of the thinking behind the Green Number Plate Initiative that was introduced a year or so ago in the UK. The idea being that by helping other road users become more aware of the fact that there's an increasing number of electric vehicles on the road, that uh, they will become perceived as more normal and therefore people might be slightly more likely to consider them uh, when they come to buy their next car as well. Okay, that's it from me. So I will wrap up just to briefly summarise with this uh, information rich but slightly dull looking slide. Um, so as I said, behavior change is whatever we want to call it, it is necessary to achieve net zero. Around about 60% of emissions reductions uh, rely on it to some extent. This relates both to these sort of curtailment behaviors like less flying red meat. Uh, I put probably there because of course, I'm perfectly open to the idea that there may be some miraculous technological solution that means we don't need to uh, reduce those behaviors at all. But at the moment, it's looking likely that we will at least have to reduce them somewhat. Um, as well as these adoption behaviours like electric cars and pumps and so on. Uh, we know that most people do care, and most people are willing, so that's a really good news story, but we also know that people tend to do things that are more easy, and unfortunately those are often the things that are less impactful. Um, our psychology is clearly quite complex, so the bits we're most self-aware of, that's the cognizant decision-making process and so on, is really just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, our behaviour is, is much more influenced than we tend to realise by non-conscious processes, like routine habits, cognitive biases, and so on, and the external environment. Uh, climate change is particularly challenging because it's too psychologically distant. Uh, we too easily sort of rationalize and fool ourselves into avoiding the, the harder actions. Uh, and it's a collective action problem where individual action alone rarely makes a huge amount of sense. Uh, but that said, by understanding behavior, we can, of course, design policies, campaigns, and so on, which make green behaviors easy and more motivating in various ways not just by persuading individuals to change their behavior within the world as it is, but perhaps more powerfully by changing the world, building a choice environment in which green behaviors are easy, cheap, uh, you know, normal, the default, et cetera.
Um, but I will finally say that uh, we are first to say that small nudges are not enough. We also need, of course, to apply a behavioral science lens to more systemic transformative change. Uh, we're doing a lot of thinking about that, but it would be an entirely additional presentation. But, you know, in brief, we need to think about smart ways to sort of tilt the functioning of markets so that green choices uh, um, scale and, uh, and propagate as rapidly as possible. Um, thinking about um, default choices across our lives and in all aspects of our lives. So thank you very much. Apologies for going five or so minutes longer than I intended, but yeah, looking forward to your questions. No, Toby, that was absolutely magic. And, and for those of you who uh, are on the line and didn't catch everything, all the nuances of a very insightful talk, uh, it will be up on the YouTube channel in uh, a couple of weeks at most. I have two questions before I hand over to Paul, because um, I, you know, I, I did the Danny Kahneman stuff years and years ago, and, and I couldn't understand why buying an electric car or heat pumps or something, which is a big thing, it's akin to your holiday thing, why that doesn't fall into the rational bucket? Why do we, yeah. why do we go with, with the, the, the cultural side? It's an interesting question, a good one. Um, I mean, firstly, I would say, I don't think it's obvious that it does go into the sort of <laughs> the more fast, non-conscious. Like, uh, I think that framework is a very useful one to think about behavior, but both sides clearly matter. So we do need to think about, you know, standard incentives and so on. And for me, things like heat pumps, the main issues are they're simply too expensive, they take too long to install, they're too complex, and so on. Uh, that said, it's not quite such a strict dichotomy. It's more that, often it's more that, even though it's a thoughtful, deliberative decision, buying electric vehicle or heat pump, there will be a bunch of stuff going on and influencing your decision that you're not aware of. Things like the extent to which social norms are influencing you, things like, you know, the extent to which your discounting of the future might be influencing your decision. Th those sort of cognitive biases are kind of like, under the surface and will still have influence on thought processes that you are engaging with and thinking about explicitly. If that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, I've yeah, I've I've done one, I'm trying to do the other, and you know, I'm trying to think through it. I have another question though, which which actually comes to my experience with trying to get heat bomb. Um there have been all sorts of government uh, incentives over the years. There was the the the, uh, the payback on electric vehicles, which was at one point only for small vehicles, now it's for all. Uh, you had the whole feed-in tariffs thing with solar voltaics and now you've got the renewable heat initiative you know ending at the end of next next month yeah i mean surely consistency and 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 people having a, a sense that they need to do it at some point rather than they have to do it now while it's open is a more effective way of, of, of grooming us to be more green yeah i would agree honestly um I think the policy landscape, uh, particularly on the energy side, has been uh, unfortunately fragmented over the last 10 years. Uh, and there is, you know, very compelling data showing the dramatic drop off in solar installations, for example, as those incentives phased out. So it's a great shame. I mean, obviously, governments make decisions and trade offs in terms of where their, their funding goes and so on. And it's very rare that any government will uh, wish to maintain a subsidy forever. Um, the sub current subsidies on electric vehicles, for instance, are unlikely to be around forever. The hope is that they're around long enough until the prices are lower so that they're, you know, just genuinely compelling options. But yeah, I do agree. And it's consistency and long term decision making is not just important for individuals to help them feel like there's a sort of a long term plan that they can come to understand that they can sort of buy into. But also, of course, really, really important for businesses to invest um, and sort of plan their strategies for years into the future that then how then consequently have profound impacts for individuals and consumers, because if we want consumers to adopt heat pumps and electric vehicles, we need heat pump manufacturers and vehicle manufacturers to invest so that those products are more you know, appealing, cheaper, etc. So I, you know, I think at the moment the UK government is thinking quite sincerely about all of this. Obviously we have the net zero strategy towards the end of last year. There's obviously got to be much more detail that comes out from that, but I, I would hope and expect to see a slightly more cohesive, holistic, and long-standing kind of, I suppose, brand and messaging um, and plan around all of this. At least that's what I would hope to see. That's it. Uh, hope is a wonderful thing. I believe Woody Allen described it as the thing with feathers. Paul, uh, <laughs> I know there are some great questions that we could go on poorly for an hour or so, but uh, please. Yes, we have plenty of questions, so I'll dive right in. Uh, so Alan takes 
time from them. So we have a question from Jim, who's asking, during the early pandemic, uh, the early part of the pandemic, people were happy to take action because it was obvious that they were suffering and dying right then. So there was no, there was no psychological distance. Uh, with climate change, there are people who are suffering right now, but are not really busy, to, at least to us in the UK. Um, so should we make them more visible to us? That's the question. How should we make them more visible to us? How should we shorten that distance? Yeah, I mean, I certainly agree with your observation. Um, I think, you know, I'm often asked, what can we learn from the COVID pandemic in terms of tackling climate change? But it was fundamentally psychologically quite a different threat to us. It was very immediate and very present, both in terms of time, which I talked about quite a bit, but also that point around, can we really imagine it happening to us? And I think maybe for the first month or two, you know, January, February, the first year, actually the UK was still a little bit in denial. We sort of felt, you know, we've, we've seen this stuff happen before in, in Asia. It's not really a British problem. But then we soon came to correct that and actually we did feel it quite strongly. Um, whereas that is absolutely not the case of climate change. Um, I mean, certainly there are some effects that are felt profoundly in the UK, flooding being the most obvious one. Um, and, you know, you do tend to see, of course, support for bold policy on climate action and so on goes up at those moments in time, as well as support for policy on climate adaptation, of course, because it's not just about mitigation. Um, in terms of how we should speak about it, um, we have to be a little bit careful there because um, this sort of somewhat speaks to my point about cognitive dissonance and our tendency to rationalise or willfully ignore an issue. We don't want to be so blunt that all we do is motivate people to turn off because it's scary, unappealing, just makes them feel more guilty for the lifestyles that they have. Uh, what we want to do is, in a sense, drive the message quite clearly and strongly, but try and keep it quite positive to encourage people to actually take steps and feel like they have the sort of can-do attitude, the self-efficacy, the procedural knowledge of actually acting. Um, what you don't want to do is depress and scare people without giving them an out, because then they will just tend to switch off or become... Uh, sort of resign themselves to hopelessness and think well it's a lost cause. You, you want to sort of combine that punchiness of message but absolutely with the positivity of how people can act and give them a sense that their actions can really make a difference. Yeah thank you very much. I mean yeah it's something that you kind of also notice just by the imagery used, the images used by people talking about climate change right. For example on this night you have the positive side of it, a solution to it, whereas the more traditional way was to show a polar bear on a melting ice Right. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. I wonder how many years the polar bear image put the sustainability sector back. I mean, it's right. It's, it's not really the most personally relevant risk to people. I mean, it, it has a certain emotional pull, perhaps. And perhaps it worked for the Uber Keen Greens, you know, decades ago when um, environmentalism was uh, was not so widespread. But now, yes, I think we need to make it relevant to people. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we have a question by... Adam Barrett, who says the majority of this is focused on individual action, but can uh, but what can be done to encourage organisations to make changes? Uh, thinking more towards house building, the use of combi boilers in new building homes. Um, uh, how do we change this? Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, some of the same principles will apply because, of course, organisations are made up of people and decision makers who will have certain behavioural characteristics and traits, um, as I've outlined today. So even things like social comparisons, I'll give you that example of the social comparisons on the energy bill, that has been shown to work at the organisational level as well. In fact, even on UK government departments, um, I think probably about 10, 12 years ago, uh, government departments in the UK were forced to publish their energy use, and that was sort of, you know, put in a, in a league table, essentially, uh, and that essentially motivated government departments to quite significantly reduce their energy consumption. So those sorts of things can still work. I do think that good regulation has a stronger role to play on businesses than individuals. I think there's a limit as to the appetite of the public and of policymakers, particularly conservative government, on imposing regulation on individual behaviour, but I think imposing it more on business practices, which then leads to the creation of a more sustainable choice environment within which consumers are operating. That's a slightly more political, powerful way to go. And of course, incentives are massively important for corporations. I mean, corporations, even those that have laudable and legitimate environmental agendas, will still generally hold to be at least equally important their commercial imperative of increasing shareholder value and so on. So incentives matter enormously. Um, so that would generally be my first port of call. And of course, that's not necessarily sort of 
super exotic, clever behavior science stuff. It's the basic classical economics, but nonetheless, I think that's where the bigger impacts will be found. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll, we'll need to wrap up. Let me go for the last question. Something else is though, a lot of people have just written to say thank you for the talk. Really, really good talk. Thank you. But the last question, uh, and maybe to you close, would be someone's asking, do you think there is still hope? Uh, I do, I do, because I think the reason there's still hope for me, I mean, you know, as, as you heard at the beginning, I'm an engineer as, as well as a psychologist, and both my engineering mindset and my social science mindset has led me to think quite deeply in terms of um, feedback loops within systems. And what I mean by that is that change can be absolutely runaway and self-exacerbating and self-accelerating. And of course, we see that in a bad sense, things like the release of methane from permafrost, which suddenly like exacerbates climate change and has a vicious cycle effect. But we shouldn't forget that solutions can also scale exponentially and through feedback loops as well. And we see a lot of feedback loops within social and economic systems where, for example, new norms can all of a sudden spread very, very quickly once they sort of get a hold and reach a sort of critical mass. We also see feedback loops within, for example, the interaction between consumers and businesses. I'll give you a one sort of small example that hasn't really taken off yet but in recent years we've all seen a growing interest in plant-based food for example so let's say a relatively small number of consumers start showing an interest in that uh, retailers then obviously make more of an effort to invest in their products and bring out new product lines and dedicate a bit more shelf space to those products that then essentially changes the choice environment within shops for all consumers so other consumers might be more likely to consider trying it because they see it they become aware of it they hear it and so it goes so that virtuous loop goes so you know, these, these positive feedback loops exist throughout society, both in, in natural systems and in social and economic systems. So we should never rule out the potential for quite rapid change. Um, and 30 years both feels like a terrifyingly short amount of time, but also if you think about how much change we've experienced technologically, socially in the last 30 years, it's also a massive amount of time. Hey, thanks, Paul. Uh, and, you know, thank you, Toby, for a uh, a truly excellent uh, kickoff to the, uh, the the year for us. Uh, for those of you who are listening who aren't members of the SCI, this is th the sort of thing we do, mainly in the area of chemistry and related sciences. But if you're not a member, why don't you join? And then you could see more stuff like this. And if this is interesting, uh, next month's, I suspect, won't be quite so much fun to engage with, but it's about marine litter. And so there's a way for that. Okay, yeah, so this is the uh, the slides. The, the, there's lots of things you should get out of, of, of SCI membership, but if you next slide, Richard. So marine litter is, is next uh, month in same sort of format. Um, then the month after we're talking about uh, agri-food science in the time of climate change. So again, a very interesting area. Uh, Philip Ball's doing the beauty of chemistry because we are chemists and we like talking about how good it is. And then uh, finally, the, the, before the, the summer break, Susan Greenfield's talking about neuroscience again. Uh, really good talks. Please join us. But uh, please, uh, thank you, Toby. Uh, and I hope you all enjoyed uh, listening. And as I said, it will be up uh, in a couple of weeks on uh, the YouTube channel. Uh, and I certainly am going to watch it again because there's stuff I kept thinking about and I had to pay attention because he was moving so quick. Toby, thank you very much. To everybody else, good night. Thank you. It's my pleasure. All the best. Thank <laughs> you.